five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey, space enthusiasts. My guest this week is the CEO and founder of Phantom Space, Jim Cantrell. Having started at JPL, Jim is also a decades-long veteran of commercial space. He has been involved in around a dozen space startups, including at SpaceX in its early days. There are probably few people who have been around the commercial space sector as much as he has. So, predictably, we don't only talk about Phantom, but about the space economy in general. Enjoy. My name is Raphael Rodkin, and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out, and also check out my episode with their CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help, expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Welcome back, space enthusiasts. It's another exciting episode of the space business podcast. I'm thrilled to be joined today by somebody who's really spent a lot of time in the space sector in, in various worlds including his most recent role at Phantom Space, which I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about. Welcome, Jim Cantrell. Uh, yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And, and Jim, as I implied, you have spent a lot of time in space in, in various roles. So typically, we start these episodes you know, by asking you to give an elevator pitch on your current company, which is Phantom Space, where you're the CEO and the founder. But if that's fine with you, and I promise we will spend ample time on, on Phantom Space, but if it's fine with you, could we back up and maybe just go through your history, how you got into the space sector, and then maybe chronologically touch on a few of the projects you've you've been involved in? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so the only thing I've really known I wanted to do for sure in life since I was a kid was race cars. So I uh, ended up going to university in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and I got rooted off into space early on because of a NASA-sponsored uh, design course uh, back in the 1980s. And uh, I signed up for it. And it was, a, it turned out to be a contest uh, among various universities in the United States. And uh, I was the top finisher and I got a uh, internship at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab back in uh, 1986. So that mm -hmm. uh, put me in, in the same uh, offices as a lot of these guys who did the Apollo era programs, you know, the lunar programs, the Mars mm -hmm. program. These were, mm -hmm. these were walking giants as far as I was concerned. So I became a, a bit of a space geek very early, sort of accidentally. And uh, that led Led to my first job in Toulouse, France, at uh, the French Space Agency, working on a uh, joint Soviet-French mission to Mars uh, called Mars 92 at the time. Spent a number of years working there until the Soviet Union fell apart and uh, came back to the United States. People treated me like I was a traitor because I'd worked for both the French and the Soviets, and uh, <laughs> that wasn't something you did back then. Yep. And um, I, I ended up getting recruited by the intelligence agencies uh, through the university I'd gone to help stop brain drain in the former Soviet Union and the space business. So spent another six or seven years in Russia helping to convert ICBMs to satellite launchers and, and do joint programs with them. And uh, that, that kind of led to a lot of um, uh, a lot of very interesting commercial work. The Planetary Society had been involved with me since the, my days at JPL. And uh, they were trying back in the day to get the Soviets and the Americans to work closer together. And that effort really continued. And uh, Lou Friedman, who uh, was one of the founders and the executive director, had this idea of launching a uh, solar sail commercially uh, mm -hmm. out of a 
out of a, a Russian submarine. So we did that in about 2000. So we converted a, a SSN-18 from a Russian submarine to a satellite launcher and, and launched a uh, purpose-built uh, solar sail. It didn't make it to orbit. Turned out the, the uh, rocket blew up when the second stage ignited. But it was an interesting experience. And uh, that led to Elon Musk calling me out of the blue in 2001, looking to have help buying Russian rockets for a mission yeah. to Mars, which he wanted to do, right? And uh, that f- what is now a famous story led us back over there a couple of times. And when the Russians were acting more or less like they're acting today, Elon decided to build a rocket himself, and that started SpaceX. So I was there for a while, uh, left SpaceX. After a few years, Elon and I couldn't really coexist in the same room. We're both, I guess, uh, alpha males with our own ideas. Yeah. And I went on to uh, work a lot of... Uh, military space activities. But then towards uh, about 2010, uh, I started to see, you know, what was the fruit of SpaceX, which, you know, Elon made space safe for investing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started to see a lot of uh, VC money take interest in the space industry. So I helped Skybox Imaging get started. They they eventually sold to Google for half a billion. Uh, We were building spy satellites basically for a couple million dollars a piece. That became part of Planet. So that was kind of the early version of planet then uh, there was a whole bunch of whole bunch of follow-ons to that so this flood of startups began about that point and uh been involved in you know i think 12 of those since since that point uh culminating today in phantom space uh, which i'm trying to solve the uh the, the problem of access to space which has been you know a theme since 2010 of, of a problem that that really constricts this commercial expansion in, in that we're currently experiencing. So, so you kind of accompanied all of the, you know, recent very interesting phase of the development of the commercial space sector, I guess, starting from the late 90s, early 2000s, right? I'm kind of ignoring the satellite communications um, constellations from the mid 90s, but sort of some of the legal changes, regulatory changes took place and uh, the big NASA projects and then you know, SpaceX being found of Blue Origin being founded, like you said, in the 2010s, uh, companies like Skybox. Now looking back over those last, say, 20 years, has this kind of played out how you imagined it would play out or has it been has it been very different? That's a good question. Yeah, no, it's quite different than I ever thought. You know, if you go back to even further than 20 years ago, you know, the entire industry was nation state dominated mm-hmm. and most nation states don't get stuff done very efficiently or sometimes even at all. And it's always expensive and political and so on. So those of us who, you know, sort of had this, this itch to do things a little speedier and get it done, we're always looking for ways outside of the government space. And, uh, you know, we, we never imagined that that the commercial uh, sector would take on venture capital money. You know, we always kind of imagined that it would have to be, you know, high net worth uh, billionaires. That was, mm. that was what we saw, you know, standing there 20 years ago. I mean, Elon was basically that. And uh, we had uh, Beal, Andrew Beal, who started a rocket company before Elon and failed at it. Mm-hmm. You know, there was, there was just this line of dead bodies of these, these people that tried to do it you know, with that kind of money. And there, were, there was a flaw in that kind of money that, you know, we knew about that, that uh, you know, this commitment of one person uh, that, that we tried to ignore. But once, once we got the attention of the venture community and, and we showed that we could actually make some money at this, it changed the character of it tremendously for the better, it became much more market-based. And uh, it, in fact, I would say today it's stripped the capability of, of what the government develops in terms of new technology, multiple folds. So I see a future now where the government is going to rely on commercial for space technology development rather than developing it itself. They will become you know, net users of that technology, much like other technology. Uh, you know, I, I use the analogy of the iPhone, you know, would, would you want the government building an iPhone? The answer generally is hell no. And, uh, you know, so uh, we, we like these things commercial. The government adopts them and uses them. And that's the rightful role of government, most people would agree. And uh, here we are. So so we never really, never really imagined that anything but nation state dominance would ever be here. We never imagined that the costs would come down to where they're at. And uh, we never imagined that there'd be so much innovation flooding into the sector. Nobody saw that. So, so talking about some of the things you were involved in, well, I guess I could ask you the same question about SpaceX, where you were involved at the very beginning. Has, has that company played out as you thought it would play out? Not at all. Not at all. So 
in my very naive thinking, okay, you gotta you gotta forgive me for where my mind was in 2002. You know, we we started the company in like December of 2001, and uh, you know, Elon's stated purpose was to build a rocket to take our mission to Mars, and it was cheaper to just do it ourselves than it was to deal with the Russians. Mm. And there was not really a discussion at that early point about how we would commercialize it. But Chris Thompson, who was, uh, you know, one of the early guys there that I recruited, and he's now my CTO at Phantom, and I and a couple others started thinking about, well, how, you know, how could we make this a sustainable thing? How could we build launch vehicles that that would make money? And, uh, you know, we started architecting different vehicles, the the Falcon 1 was really a small vehicle that we thought could be mass manufactured mm. and that uh, we, we thought that the small satellites were probably the future, uh, but we didn't know how fast that would come. And there really wasn't a huge market for it then. And, and I architected the Falcon 5, which never got built. Uh, that was the Delta II replacement rocket. Mm. So. What I didn't realize, I did, but I didn't, that was that Elon's real goal was to send humans to Mars. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, early on, I, w- I can tell you, uh, you know, before we st- decided to start SpaceX, he would, you know, tell people, hey, you know, we're going to go build this rocket ourselves. And then, you know, sort of after dinner, he would show me these base for Mars bases uh, plans that he had somebody drawing up. You know, my advice to him was to put that away. It's like talking about aliens. Uh, he had enough <laughs> credibility issues with saying you're going to build a rocket. You yeah. might get an insane asylum for that. Get well, off investors. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, you talk about scaring people off. So, so no, I, you know, as I watched this, Elon told me, and I believe him at face value, that he was going to put $100 million of his own money into this, and that was it. And, you know, and, and I, I, I knew he had the money, but I, I, I thought, well, that's not going to do it, right? That's not going to make it. And I never could conceive that he could convince anybody to write a, you know, let alone a million dollar check, a $50 million check, mm-hmm. like he, like he did Steve Jurvetson. So, you know, Elon's ability to raise money was completely foreign to me. So I didn't see that part coming. And I, I, I evaluated the company along the following lines. I said, look, probably the best value it's going to have is what he put into it. That, that's the best outcome. And, uh, you know, we were talking about a 5% stake in it for me. And I said, well, that's $5 million. I can go make that on my own in a few years. And uh, so that's what I did. I, I went out on my own and mm. started a consulting company. I, I made really great money. And mm. so for many years, I was pretty smug about it, having made a great choice. And, you know, Elon was difficult to work with. So I uh, w- was relieved I didn't have to uh, deal with 3 a.m. phone calls and things like that. But none of us saw this guy's brilliance, I don't think. I mean, we knew he was smart, mm. but but the, he has this whole plan in his head. And he knows how it's going to play out was, was really news to me. He, he didn't really share that with most of us, which is kind of surprising. Surprising. You know, Tesla's the same thing. I got to talking to him about Tesla, you know, because I'm a car guy. And, uh, you know, I was criticizing, you know, giving up the Roadster. Well, I came across some pitch decks that, that he put together for, for Tesla from the early days. And it was very simple. We're going to make the Roadster, use that money to make a, a commercially viable uh, uh, consumer car. We're going to yeah. use that money to make a better consumer car. Yeah. And then while we're doing all of this, we're going to we're going to essentially start a whole new industry of, of uh, non, non-petroleum-based vehicles. I mean, had he told me that, I would, have, I would have totally seen a different thing. But Elon kept a lot of that to himself. And so, you know, most of us were required to work with him uh, on, on a basis of being 100% in, yet... You know, I in particular never saw his vision, so so I left, and uh, I, I never expected him to succeed. Uh, but once they started to, um, I started to pay attention, and I started to really look inward at, at you know why I made the decisions I did and where I was wrong, and uh, you know what I didn't see. And uh, you know, I, I'm grudgingly very much admire the man, and uh, very much admire what he's done. So yeah, I, perhaps I should have stayed. But I didn't, and that's that's the way it is. That's the rest is history. But I do think, I mean, I'm sort of trying to um, make a connection to phantom space and the current state of the space sector as well. There's a couple, at least a couple of elements in the SpaceX story that you have already touched upon, which I do believe are relevant still today. So, so one is that decision or that famous story that Elon went to Russia and tried to see where he can get a rocket, right? He didn't necessarily have to take the entire rocket, right? He could have just decided he does the, the frame in the US and like slap some Yuzmash or something engines from Ukraine on it as other people have done until very recently, right? Um, and that I think continues a question for many small launchers up until today is sort of like, do you really have to build your engines in-house or can you just take somebody else's engines? So that that's one question, I think, which is sort of um, 
relevant from the SpaceX story. And the other one, which is probably even more relevant, and I'll ask you to comment on both of those, but the second one would be that I think part of Elon's brilliance has been that you have Starlink. And of course, one of the functions of Starlink, as I understand it, is to you know hopefully produce a lot of cash flow, which will finance the Mars missions. But it has the nice side effect that it manufactures a lot of demand for its launch vehicles. And of yeah. course, launch, ca- launch cadence has been a big issue for launch providers historically. Yeah, so you, you, those are really good points. Um, the first one uh, about uh, you know his 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 vehicle and uh, and you know what what he saw as the you know the right way to do it with you know vertical integration of the of the supply chain was something he and I often would argue about. And again, my you know coming from the background I came from, uh, we always had a supply chain. None of us ever tried in the in the government sector to. You know, make everything ourselves because we can never win anything from the government. Uh, you know, if we were gonna, we we could do all those things, but you mm-hmm. couldn't propose it and win the government money to actually use their money to do it. So mm-hmm. you're always relying on, you know, these guys have done this and they've got heritage and so on. So that kind of patchwork um, was what I wanted to start with. But Elon made the point, and he was right. And this is one of the points I was wrong about was that you know you have to be able to get away from the the what I call the military industrial complex cost uh, basis mm. would be to build your own and get rid of the inherent inefficiencies in it that, that exist because they do business with the government. And at least in the U S you know, I've, I've gone on record as calling U S government procurement system, particularly in the DOD, a Soviet economic system mm. because they have a five-year plan. Five year plans. <laughs> they specify the, the, the product, they specify the price and you expect to get a better result than the Soviets. Well, guess what? It didn't happen, right? And uh, so, so Elon saw this and uh, decided that 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 was a, a good plan to control the cost. The second thing, which I think was equally important, was that there would be, uh, if he's successful, there would be a lot of uh, rice bowls, if you will, that would be raided, uh, and there would be retaliation from other providers. Boeing specifically mm-hmm. was one that uh, approached me at at one point about you know taking on Elon and SpaceX, and I declined the opportunity to ruin my career with them. But uh, that you know they they would and tried to re- retaliate and they would use every lever they had including their strong relationships with suppliers so between those two things the smartest thing he did was to build his own engines and then he went into the avionics and the software and did all that himself you mm-hmm. almost universally have to build your own structures and mechanisms because those are all pretty unique and you have to get good at that so so it ended up they pretty much built everything that is not really true today because the supply chain has morphed and it's no longer a government-dominated industry, mm. have, you have a much more commercial supply chain. It is still developing. We buy our engines, for example, from Ursa Major in Colorado, mm-hmm. and they produce them at a price point I couldn't do it for myself. You know, we've, we put in a five-year-long order. Our first orders are on, on schedule. They're, they're qualified. Everything's working mm-hmm. uh, on cost. You know, it, it's, it's like a dream come true. And, you know, avionics, in our case, we uh, license from NASA, uh, along with the software for $20,000, go figure, they had a <laughs> IP licensing program. You know, so, so we found a lot of ways to avoid that and still end up with pretty much a strong control over our outcome. You're trading risks okay when you when you develop all these technologies in house you have you have technology development risk you have cost risk you, you have to have very patient investors that are willing to put a lot of money into it and most of these launch companies you see are requiring 100 to 200 million dollars to just get into space and you know that's what i saw in the beginning of spacex which is why i said 100 million wasn't enough i knew that but you know with with the supply chain and utilizing that we at Phantom, for example, will make it to space for well under 100 million. And because we're leveraging other people's money that we don't have to raise and spend and doesn't come out of our valuation. So it's a, you know, it's a different world today than it was back then. Now, I think your comment about Starlink is very perceptive. Most people don't recognize that there's a tremendously positive synergy between making your own satellites and launching. And I will say that was one of my ideas in the very early days of SpaceX was to actually build the satellites that we would launch, recognizing that you know the satellite providers back then couldn't make a sustainable business case because their cadence wasn't high enough. Mm-hmm. And the launch companies had the same problem. So my yep. thought was combine those two together so that you'd have a you know an essentially a, a work 
workforce base and a, and a, a manufacturing capacity that's fully utilized uh, and uh, didn't have you know strong dips and whatnot that caused huge losses in it. And uh, what what Starlink has shown, however, is quite the same thing, but it's it, the outcome or, or the effect on the market is different. If you look at Iridium, which I worked on. You know, we took $14 billion for the first constellation. The second one was 2.8. And uh, that kind of money, if you go raise it in the commercial markets, has to have a very low risk associated with it. Nobody's going to give you that kind of money unless you can show the risk is very, very low. You know, you could raise a million dollars at high risk, but you can't raise a hundred million dollars at high risk. You certainly can't raise multiple billions. So any of these big constellations that anybody proposed had to be had to be capitalized at multiple billions of dollars. And so one of the things that drives that cost is launch. So if you're using your internal launch capacity, uh, you can do that at your internal cost. If you're making the satellite yourself. You can do that at your internal mm-hmm. cost. Mm-hmm. And your gross margins on these things are roughly 30% if it's well run. And, and this had the second effect on SpaceX, which you mentioned, which is the launch rate goes up. And once that happens, then the flyout rate you know, drops the net cost of your standing army mm-hmm. for every mm-hmm. launch. And so that's how SpaceX has managed to get their costs way down. And they're the only ones that are operating a big constellation the size of Starlink. Nobody else mm-hmm. is. And I think everybody else is going to have a hard time doing that until they adopt this model. We at Phantom recognize it, and this is this is our business model, is we do both the satellites and the launch vehicles at a la Starlink, right? We'll do it for customers or for ourselves and for us. And uh, we can capitalize, furthermore, we can capitalize future satellite networks of our own through our own high valuation, right? Rocket companies tend to be valued in the billions of dollars. Therefore, mm-hmm. raising a couple hundred million on, say, a three or four billion dollar valuation is, is a relatively easy thing to do uh, compared to uh, you know starting from scratch and saying, "Hey, here we are. We're gonna we're gonna make this big satellite constellation, but we don't have anything of value to put up except our great ideas." So that tends yeah. to be a steep hill to climb. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it seems interesting. It seems like, you know, the, having seen how this works with Starlink, now some of the other launch companies are more or less copying it, right? I think Astra has a proposal for a Earth Observation Constellation. Right. Um, I think, um, well, clearly Rocket Lab is using its Photon platform in more and more ways. It seems like you, you were saying Phantom is thinking along the same lines. So what can you tell us what the use case be would be for what kind of constellations you guys are thinking about? Yeah, so w- right now we have uh, two constellations under contract for third parties. Um, one is an IoT, Internet of Things constellation, and the second one is a, a radar imaging satellite constellation. And uh, what we're doing on that is, is uh, and, and these guys arrive at our doorstep at various stages, we finance the first part of the constellation design and then the first satellite, we, we finance that on our own. We do that at our internal cost in exchange for revenue share on the back end of their business model. And so that allows us to keep the intellectual property of the satellites, uh, as well as uh, give give these uh, startups something of great value that they can then go out and raise the rest of the money to build out the constellation. So we will then build and fly out the rest of the constellation uh, on our rockets and build the satellites in our factories and uh, do that at a uh, at an advantage cost, not not necessarily our internal cost. And uh, that, that's one part of the business model that's actually very, very popular. We've had to sort of put the brakes on that because we've reached capacity, what we can handle right now on that. We have several other satellite contracts as well that are not constellations. But uh, the, the one that we're planning on ourselves uh, is what we call Phantom Cloud. And it's essentially a data backhaul. Um, we're looking to essentially take uh, ground stations and put them on satellites. Not not literally, but figuratively and functionally. And so that function then is absorbed into a network of LEO satellites, where if you're a satellite operator operating above the constellation, you simply broadcast down to it. Uh, we take care of moving the data through our through our various uh, uh, satellites down to a ground station at a very low latency of you know a few minutes rather than uh, something on the order of hours like it takes you to wait for a ground station. So that's the beginning of our of that application. We have layers that will add to that that have interfaces with the uh, connected car world 
uh, we're looking at uh, connections into the essentially the equivalent of IoT and uh, even potentially a, a poor man's uh, uh, Starlink, which would be a, an ability to talk directly to the 802.11 devices on the ground in, in the uh, public license bands without uh, having to get special licenses for it. So we're still working on some of the some of the patents there and uh, some of the technology to accomplish that. But that would be you know sort of the path that this constellation takes. So in the in the, in the first examples you mentioned, um, the IoT and the and, and and the radar, I assume that's that's that SAR synthetic aperture radar, right? Um, so those are startups that came to you. And so what do the startups provide? Do they provide sort of the payload and then the whole like uh, uh, downstream backend, so to say, like uh, getting the customers? And then you guys do the rest. Is that how I should think about it? Yeah, in the case of the IoT, you know, they're they're an existing IoT network that that has been around for a while, but Earth based, and they want to add a space based layer to make mm. it global. And so they have the technology on the on the transmit, receive, and and the and the backbone for the data distribution. So we we'll clearly use all of that. Um, we're working with them to re-engineer and space rate their payloads um, because they're not space people, mm-hmm. and uh, they would uh, allow us to uh, operate the satellites, but then they would operate the network uh, in, in the sense of operating the data side of it. So. In terms of the the radar imaging constellation, uh, it's very much a uh, payload provided by the constellation operator because we know nothing about radar. Well, I can't say nothing, but we're not radar experts for sure. Mm. And uh, we know how to build radar uh, compatible satellites because we already have one under contract. And uh, so, so, you know, they will... uh, then operate the uh, constellation. Theirs is aimed at, at, at military applications, where they mm-hmm. do a, sort of a data sale to uh, the military customer. So, if I summarize all of this, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, it sounds like so your combination of like you know you have the the, the launch kit, the in-house launch capability, you have the in the in-house spacecraft capability, but then it's basically also offering like what sometimes people call like space as a service, right? Take right. like especially especially if it's like somebody like you said like the um, IoT guys who are actually not space people, you try to take out the entire friction of the process right is yeah. that sort of yeah it's exactly right so my theory is that this this the space business to get to the next level of of volume of you know advancement really requires two things one is we have to get past launch and and access to space being mm. an exceptional thing and it has to be an accepted everyday thing and so that requires much more frequent launch uh and then the second thing is we have to lower the barriers for non-space people to bring their ideas their talents their innovations and place them in space and you know an example, uh, it would be websites. When I started my first website, I had mm-hmm. to know HTML. And that was, yep. I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And yes. now today, I go out on Squarespace and yep. I, I put together a much better site, you know, in, in 30 minutes <laughs> and not a single yes. day. No. Yes, I mean, let, let alone, I mean, uh, the, I, I love that comparison, right? In the internet, um, I'm old enough to remember the same thing you're remembering there. But now, like, if you want to set up your internet shop, right, you just go to Shopify and then everything else is, is abstracted away. And I yeah. guess we're only, we're probably still very early on on that, um, let's say, a simplification journey in space, I suppose. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no, space is still dominated by the geeks, right? And and we're, we're an arrogant bunch. And, you know, we don't necessarily want to teach people. And it does take a lot of years to learn these episodes esoteric lessons and so on. So we've got to find a way to to essentially close that gap and make make the whole business of space transparent to the innovators and then ultimately to the users. It sounds like you're thinking a lot about this. This is frankly something I'm thinking a lot about it and I call it by various names. Like I, I talked about friction very often. I say we need to take the friction out of space. Um, so it becomes, you know, as normal as, um, let's say, uh, now it's, I think it's fair to say that artificial intelligence is now normally used right. in almost every, every business. But that was not the case 10, that was not the case 10 years ago right and then somehow we managed somehow we managed to kind of uh, make it normal do you have any sort of vision how we could um, you know promote the use of space to to to, so it becomes normal for non-space businesses to to use space technology yeah i mean my 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 ultimate vision is something where um you know i don't know it's spaceapplications.com just Mm. to pick random name that you log into and it says what space business do you want to start today and mm-hmm. say, gee, I've got a, I've got a communications idea. So you click that. It says, what kind of communications would you like to do? And you choose between, you know, four options: inter satellite, satellite to ground, person to person, you know. And then, and it goes through the whole process, and then. It, 
puts you in touch with people who might want to finance it, who might want to build it, who might want to operate it. And before long, you've got this, it's like buying a car, right? I can go out and configure my car on, on the website and then place mm-hmm. the order by calling the dealership. And then, you know, then it gets a little more involved because you got to deal with some of these things. But that's kind of what I see the future becoming. And on the, on the hardware side, you know, in order to enable that, we have to have systems that are software centric rather than hardware centric. Right mm. now, most space systems are hardware centric. And so it, that needs to evolve. And I think it's evolving in that direction to the point where we can put software expert systems in space mm. so that, uh, you know, the, these kinds of various retasking of, of a single piece of hardware can happen, right? It, it, clearly, you're not going to make uh, something that's designed to move bits, uh, mm. uh, mm. Some, you know, to receive photons. And you know, so there are some physics that can't be overcome. But by and large, I think we can, you know, make a sort of a generic communications satellite, for example, uh, or a generic imaging satellite that you might have a number of different bands you can look at and so on. Uh, that'll take some real advances in technology, but it's got to be there along with the software side of it. And and that, you know, once once the space business starts to look like the software business, like tech as we as we refer to tech in the bigger picture, uh, I, I think we've got something that that'll just grow out of uh, you know out of bounds in no time. It's 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 the equivalent to me of the economic opportunity of the new world was five hundred years ago. Mm. And we just mm. don't know what it'll look like. We, there's no way to know what it'll look like. Like five hundred years ago, there was no way to know what this place would look like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's not even five hundred years. One could say that maybe. Maybe in 1996, people trying to project the internet had no idea what happened 10 years later. Right. Right. I, I remember I, I've tripped over so many billion dollar fortunes. You know, I was a very early adopter of the internet. And I remember looking at it and thinking, well, you know, Leonard Cohen sites are out there. And I like Leonard Cohen, so I read those. And then there, there's porn. Like, okay, well, that's yep. obviously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then there was... Uh, I don't know, these sort of self-promotion things, these these strange little little sites, you know, kind of pre-Facebook kinds mm-hmm. of things. And that was it. I said, I said, how are you going to be on this? Nobody's going to sell anything on the internet. Yes. I, I remember this very well. This is actually, uh, so this is the kind of picture I always give when, you know, when we're talking about our own, um, I run a venture fund, right, called E2MC Ventures, a space venture fund. I always say people, I believe this is similar to the internet in 95 or 96. And I'm old enough to remember that at that point in time, most of the internet entrepreneurs were very few anyway, right? But they were pretty much computer science people, like Mark Andreessen, which makes sense, internet computer science. And then it took a few years, and then you got non-computer science people realizing what was going on, how big the opportunity was, and it unleashed the animal spirits and the human creative entrepreneurship. And that's what I think we have to unleash in space, and it hasn't happened yeah. just yet. It hasn't happened at all. No, it's, you know, it started off as a few billionaires poking at it, and, uh, you know, that was our original view of how things were. And then and the VC money comes in, and it literally just pokes at it. And, and you know, no no offense to anybody who's a VC, but the most of them don't have the first clue about the mm. space business. And they, they throw a software template on it. And that will change, mm-hmm. right? There'll be people mm-hmm. like you who come in specialize in space investments and so on. But that has yet to really happen mm-hmm. on, a, on a large scale. It's, it's happening. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like you say, the, the, the entrepreneurs, they'll find the opportunity and they'll go crazy with it. It's just right now, you know, this podcast is a great example. I spend a lot of my time explaining to the public what the opportunity is of space. And so I'm, I'm the, you know, the space evangelist, if you mm-hmm. will, about the economic opportunity here. And you and I both see it, right? Mm-hmm. And we have we have difficulties articulating it because it mm-hmm. is it is uh, very complicated, just like the internet was mm-hmm. hard for people to articulate how that would actually be used. Yeah, but I'm, I'm with you there. I spend uh, probably 10 to 20% of my time on this, what you call the evangelism, because I think it's so important to get the message out yeah. right now. But b- backing up, um, you were talking about something interesting, which you are mentioning like the software, right? And I guess software, correct me if you think otherwise, but that's like a prime example of like, right now we seem to redo the software stack every time we build a new satellite. Like it's, it's, it's ridiculous, right? So this touches upon also the element of standardization or interoper- interoperability and maybe the lack thereof. And would you think this is like another thing we, we, we need to change? And then is that something where maybe, I, I feel like that's something that the government could help and maybe like, you know, some of the things that the, the SDA and the military US is doing could, you know, help us push for more standardization and, and, and hence, you know, help us along the way there. Well, you know, strangely, I think 
and I wouldn't normally say this, but you know, if the government picks a winner and a loser uh, by virtue of the fact they're the 900 pound gorilla, as we say uh, in in the business, you know that that will choose a standard. It's like beta versus VHS. Mm. You know, once that was chosen, it didn't matter that most people think beta was a better, it's better, yeah, solution. Uh, VHS was what you could buy, right? And mm-hmm. so a certain amount of that has to happen, and it's you know it's Mac versus PC. I'm a Mac guy, uh, but I was always a PC guy because that was what was available until I started using the Mac and I'm convinced the Mac's better, but you know, the government and everybody else in the world uses the PC. So that's by far the dominant uh, uh, use. And and it's really going to come down to that. And what, what's interesting is the supply chain around the world right now has, has shifted. You know, there, there used to be a huge supply chain for satellite and, and software uh, components here in the U.S. And suddenly, like Eastern Europe has proliferated, the Baltics, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Hungary, uh, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of these, lot of these European countries, France, amazes me. I'm, I'm a work there, and we used to make jokes about you know the French uh, work ethic. But by God, they're they're doing great stuff with the uh, with startup space. It's amazing mm-hmm. how that's taking place, and it, a lot of it's software and uh, avionics and electronics and things like that. So, so you know, there, there's there's going to be some shifts like that going on around the world too. And one of the things that most people don't think about that I became aware of uh, in the last three or four years is in the U.S. government at least they're very concerned about supply chain security mm. that it appears that there are bad actors that are you know nation level bad actors that seek to sabotage supply chain uh, mm. to seek a you know, competitive advantage oh what a surprise right <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do something like that but it, you know just sort of brings you back to reality that, hey you know the, the world's not uh, suddenly transformed into this wonderful place just because we're doing wonderful things it's we still have to deal with those old realities yeah I mean you certainly can't put all of your acts in um, in one basket, right? I'm mean, right. ger- German by birth. I'm painfully aware of um, <laughs> that on the energy side, <laughs> but okay, that's a long topic. But on the on the space side, actually, let's open up a bracket on that just for maybe for a few minutes because you have so much experience in the, the old Soviet Union and in Russia. Um, so obviously, that used to be a not insignificant part of the space supply chain. I mean, uh, used mass engines from Ukraine, uh, Fakel in space prop- um, uh, propulsion, a Soyuz launch vehicle. Um, yep. I mean, I guess that's pretty much all off the table now. What, how do you see the effects of what's going on right now? It, it- the effects of the Russians essentially removing themselves from the space business is is profound, I think. Um, It's shocking to me. Uh, I watched the Russians shoot themselves in the foot, as we like to say, twice. You know, once with Elon when we went over there. They could have sold him the damn rockets and sold him really cheap, and he'd have never built SpaceX, right? But he built SpaceX, and he arguably put the Russians out of the commercial launch. Mm. And then what they have left of it, which is what they negotiated with NASA, with ESA, and, you know, Know, some of these, you know, like OneWeb and some of these other guys, it, you know, with the Ukraine reaction, they shot themselves in the foot completely again by s- saying, well, we're going to take our marbles and go home and you can't play with us anymore. So really childish reactions on both sides, which is kind of interesting. You know, uh, I, I don't, um, my experience with the Soviet bear, as I call it, is is not one of, of triviality. Um, they're, they're a very dangerous uh, foe if, if they become a foe. And I fear that that what's going on is is sort of Russia, you know, sort of turning inward a little bit in an isolationist kind of way. And I think the end result uh, is going to be most of their rocket technology is going to slowly die because without that Western dollar, without that Western demand, the ability to keep a lot of these manufacturing lines up and going is going to die. I know even in the early 90s when I was over there, that was one of the things we were finding was their supply chain within the former Soviet Union was really disrupted from you know, the, the split of the Soviet Union, a lot of it being in Ukraine, but then just, you know, small groups that no longer were getting paid by the government disbanded. And, you know, they would build mm. this this electronics box. So to get a, a a telemetry system, for example, for our solar sail was a nightmare because nobody in, the, in Russia made it anymore. And, you know, clearly they knew how to do that, but they had to source that stuff out of Germany. And uh, so, so you, you're just going to see that, I think, accelerate here. Uh, the Russians have done a a pretty good job of destroying the infrastructure and in Ukraine, you know, labeling it as a weapons uh, manufacturer. They, they sent about 20 cruise missiles into the, the Nepper factory there, uh, the Uzmash uh, factory. Saw some pictures of it, and I have some friends that were over there that saw it as well. It's gone. Uh, the people are 
gone, uh, that that talent and experience has been distributed to the wind. So what we're witnessing now is a reshuffling of the entire supply chain worldwide uh, on launch. It's going to cause launch shortages. We're seeing it already yep. at, at Phantom. We're getting enormous enormous demand for our launch services. And uh, our first launch is about a year away. And we, we we probably have about 50 launch service agreements we're going to be able to announce in bulk here. If we get enough of them together, we'll do it. But it, we're, we're very, very busy signing up new customers. Um, you know, and, and Russia was the trigger for that. A lot of them have come off of those vehicles. So you see a lot of these other startups that have relied on, on the Ukrainian engines that are really in a crisis. And they haven't started to talk about it publicly. There's been some some wine mm. here and there, but uh, Firefly, for example, uh, yep. I'm, I'm told internally that they never completely built that engine in the U.S. The Reaver that they uh, mm. had gotten from Ukraine that was still being built over there. So they may they may have some issues there. That may be why they teamed up with Northrop Grumman, uh, which they announced at the Small Sack Conference mm. uh, to to do liquid propulsion engine work. You've got by derivative, you've got uh, Astra who licensed mm-hmm. that engine. You've got uh, a number of the European startups with uh, pump fed engines that are mm-hmm. uh, you know searching for that kind of expertise. Uh, we know Ursa Major gets a lot of inquiries now from people who lost that ability, right? And it was smart of us to have bought their capacity for the next five years <laughs> because they're not able to take on new clients. So mm. really, it, 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 we're, we're in a shortage in the world. And, and this is kind of what I predicted anyhow, but it, the Russian actions have really exacerbated that mm. closing that that bracket i mean we could talk about this probably four hours just about this topic but coming back to phantom space but now we've talked about that you know you have the launch capability you have spacecraft capability space, space as a service and so forth but you were talking about sort of like spacex vision and elon's vision and how it wasn't completely transparent to everybody at the beginning but what is is there a way you can summarize your vision for phantom or sure. if i could ask in another way like if you're talking to like a potential investor or potential key employee and you yeah. want to you want to get them excited it's like how do you summarize the phantom vision we, we like to say we intend on becoming the Henry Ford of space by applying mass manufacturing technology to both launch vehicles and satellites to lower both the costs and barriers to getting applications and ideas in space. Okay, so a lot of these things we've already talked about, the, the need for high exactly. cadence, um, vertical integration and so forth. Okay, terrific. And the other question I had, so like you mentioned somewhere at the beginning, you were involved in even in recent history in something like a dozen startups, um, well-known ones, you know, Vector, Moon Express, uh, just a couple have come to mind. Um, yeah. Isai, prominent radar York. company, of course. York, a prominent integrator. So, so you've you've had a lot of different experiences. How have all of these experiences flown into Phantom and where there's, I don't know, like maybe a few key lessons that yeah. kind of flew into into phantom space boy that's a great that's a great topic uh like you said i could go for 40 hours on that you know i i've i've, I've seen a lot of good bad and ugly right in all of these things and uh you know on on most of these companies i've been involved with they've been successful moon express was not vector was not you know so i saw a lot of the things you don't do and in in many ways i think those have been more valuable to what we do at, at phantom than than the ones that were successful because it's easy to not see why those things are successful sometimes uh, it's a lot easier to see why things aren't. And so uh, uh, the big lessons I have for a startup are as follows. The first one is that when you put together a team, it's very, very, very fundamental. And the most important thing you can do is have a team of people who are like-minded, right? I'm not talking politically. I'm not talking, you know, that they, they, they all believe in the same thing, but they're fundamentally the same type of people, right? So at Phantom, for example, we think of ourselves as builders, makers, and doers rather than pontificators and paper pushers. Mm. And so we, we value as, as a group this rugged individualistic accomplishment and responsibility for what you do and the value of creating something that's a value, that, that's that's something you can touch and smell. You know, when, I, when I look at countries around the world, I you know my wife's German, so I I also uh, I see Germany as being very much built on that so that sort of ethic of you know we've got to build something that's got to be high quality and it's got to be done right you know so so whatever it is you're doing you have to figure out what that what that like mindedness is and you have to recruit along those lines right otherwise you have people who who don't fit and you know they're going to want to take things in a different direction and create strife and 
it uses up a lot of energy and time and it just never works. And, and uh, you know, it ultimately becomes fractures in, in the company. Uh, there was a line in, in a movie, an American movie, where it said this was the crack that let the water in the, in the rock that froze and split the rock apart. You know, that's, that's, how, that's how mismatches do. So that's number one. Number two is you, you never spend any money that doesn't advance either your ability to raise your next round of money or get to your, your next major milestone. You, you just don't. There's going to be a lot of pressure, you know, for example, get your manufacturing capacity ready for when you when you do get your product going, you can scale it. The problem is sometimes you don't know exactly what that schedule is and you use resources in, an, in a way that you could use otherwise that would be a bit better put to use. So, so that kind of, you know, sort of fundamentally cheap ethic, if you will, is really, really important to making, uh, making these, these things turn out. And then, um, you know, lastly, I, I, w- I would say that you, know, you, you have to be very transparent as a leader. You have to be very transparent with your staff. And, you know, you, you obviously don't have to show them your bank registers, but, you know, you, you got to gotta tell them what, what it is over and over we're trying to do. Make sure that they all understand that and that they're in line with this and what their part in it is, what their benefit of, of this, this working out is. If people aren't in line with that, you got to get rid of them very, very quickly. And uh, you, you can't afford to have uh, bad people around. So those are really kind of the big ones. They, they apply to all other businesses too. But I think the you know the the one about you know how you spend your money in the early stages is very particular to startups um, and and very 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 important. I've I've had a lot of VCs and other investors give me some very bad advice, right? And as a leader, I've I've had to later on sort of understand that you know I appreciate their perspectives, but you know, they, they invested in me because they believe that I know this business and I know how to take it to where it needs to go. So mm-hmm. to be polite and say, please let me do that. Right. So following on from that, if you had to think about the sort of core DNA or core competence, whatever you will call it, of Phantom, is that some of the things you were talking about just now, like the very special culture and team, or how would you define the core, the, the yeah. DNA, the core competence? Yeah, the, the DNA is, you know, we're, we're here in Arizona, which is a, not a place everybody wants to live. And it turns out it's become a good filter for, you know, the, the kinds of values we have as a group of people. You know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a libertarian sort of existence here, live and let live. And people, mm-hmm. from, you know, any walk of life are welcome, uh, but we don't impose, we don't impose sort of a worldview on everybody else. We're very we're tolerant of individualism, right? The other side of it is that it's um, uh, an environment that's very free from government intervention. And I think that's, you know, in the early stages of an industry like we're at, very important because, you know, the, the government can skew markets and uh, we've seen it, you know, in our lifetimes, well-intentioned actions uh, end up benefiting one sector, but it, you know, causes the whole entire thing. So we're really able to get the help from the government we need by being here when we need it uh, and and avoid most of that interference. But, uh, you know, in, in the end, it's it's the place where we all like to build things. And I think that's probably, if I had to say one thing that's in our DNA, is we're all builders, right? A lot of us are, are race car people. We build race cars mm-hmm. in our spare time. I do. Uh, mm-hmm. My CEO does. Um, my CEO doesn't, but you know, he builds other things, you know, he's, he's into his house and does, but we're all, you know, one way or another, uh, very hands-on, very, uh, very busy to building things. Okay. Terrific. Are you, are you guys hiring right now? So we're closing the series B and, uh, we stopped the hire until we're done with the B, but we'll resume probably in about uh, a month or two. Terrific. Terrific. And I'm just going to slightly back up. I realized that we were talking about uh, your launch capability all along, and I haven't actually asked you so just to summarize your your vehicle, sort of like sure. the size, the capability. Yeah, our, our first vehicle is called the Daytona. And yes, it's named after the racetrack. <laughs> I figured. And, uh, <laughs> of course. And uh, it's 500 kilos to orbit uh, is the, you know, sort of the standard capacity. That'll service about 80% of the small satellite market. And uh, we've done a lot of background work. We think that's the right size. It's, uh, you know, block one, it's got three blocks uh, that we're developing. Block one, which will be the first one we fly, is all aluminum. Uh, Block two will have a lot of composite pieces. Again, this is another illustration of how we don't spend money until we need to. We recognize we can still get a vehicle to orbit with the metallic structures, and that way we don't spend money on these expensive 
this expensive tooling and fixturing for the composites. Once we show the basic design works, then we'll start converting piece parts of the, the vehicle to composites. And that was, a we thought, a less costly upgrade, uh, given that later money is less expensive than early money, and it gets us there faster. So ultimately, we go from what's nine engines, nine Hadley engines on the first stage uh, for a block one-to-one -one Ripley, and uh, we're using the Ursa Major 5,000-pound Hadley's their box kerosene engine that they've uh, qualified, and I think they have about forty thousand seconds of runtime on on their on their engines. So a very very well understood engine, um, and uh, we're selling it for four million bucks. Uh, so you know if you look at that compared to Rocket Lab, who sells one hundred eighty kilograms for about mm -hmm. seven million, it's quite a bargain. And we know the 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 cost of our our piece parts to a very precise level because we've already bought a lot of it and uh, a lot of it's on order uh and so we're truly coming in for our first unit well under four million dollars um we'll be flying out of vandenberg first mm -hmm. we have uh, slick five which we've leased from the uh, air force or space force i guess that's the old nasa scout pad and uh, we'll be putting together a dual uh, pad out there on the slick five we're working on a multi-user complex uh, out at Cape Canaveral, and then uh, Alaska is another one we'll launch out of. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you we've got clearance from Vandenberg for 48 launches a year, which I think is more than even SpaceX has clearances for. Mm -hmm. so, so we think that that is the, the thing that we need to enable our business model long term. That's one of the differences between us and a lot of the other companies is we start thinking about how do we launch a lot of these right up front. We, we think the business of getting a launch vehicle, operating and, and making them in, in so-called mass is, is relatively easy compared to the business of how do you deal with the regulatory side of launching a lot of them. So, mm -hmm. we've, you know, we, we started early on with that, that regulatory side and have had great successes so far. And so, again, coming back to, to vision, I mean, we've touched upon this a few times already and said, okay, the, the Henry Ford of space and all of this and the various business you're involved in. But if, we, if you had to look 10 years out, what is sort of like, ideally, where will Phantom space be? Well, I, I like to think of Phantom as sort of the next SpaceX. I know uh, other people have said that same thing, but, you know, in, in a lot of ways, we're the same DNA that created SpaceX. And uh, we have the same idea, but 20 years later. So SpaceX adopted to the microsatellite is really the kind of way I see it. Okay, if you don't mind giving your ample expertise, um, there's just a few questions I wanna ask you about the, the space sector in general, and maybe in a, if you don't mind, in a rapid fire way, because otherwise we're gonna be here for hours, no, which I'd, yeah, love, I'd, lo I'd, love to, I'd love to do, but our listeners are kind of used to a one hour podcast or so. So maybe no particular order. Well, we can start with SpaceX. Starship may fly, may, may try for orbital relatively soon. Um, how do you see the so-called Starship effect? Some people call it a potential Starship singularity. Yeah, I don't think Starship's built to launch satellites. I think it's built to launch people, boring machines to Mars, and lots of Teslas to Mars. OSM, or orbital services and manufacturing businesses, big topic, including in the government. How do you think is going to be the evolution of that market? I think it's a great idea. I think it's 50 years in the future. Space debris, how worried are you? So I'm one of the few that are not, because... If you launch the satellites in the right place, Mother Mother Earth takes care of the problem for you. It's going to have to be a regulatory solution that's market-based like insurance for third-party uh, collisions. Space workforce and workforce development. Is there, a, is there a bottleneck? Is there a risk of a bottleneck? Is there something we should do? Yeah, the, there is a bottleneck. And the cause of that is the universities, which are horrible. And uh, you'll find most of the uh, people that are getting into startups are doing it without any in the university degrees, uh, which used to be considered required. So uh, we've got to rethink the education system by really to make this this uh, much more viable industry. Then we've already touched upon supply chain. And, and you were mentioning the parts of the government um, uh, sometimes seemed like a Soviet five-year system. <laughs> is there still something we can improve on the supply chain and what are, what are specific things we could do? Yeah, I, I, continued diversification of the supply chain is is really great. And I'm, I'm encouraged to see venture capital starting to think about this. I think, you know, venture capital can play a very important role 
in how the industry develops if they take a thoughtful approach. And, uh, you know, I don't mean to make investments where it won't make you money, but I actually think there's a lot of money to be made there uh, that a lot of VCs haven't recognized that yet, but they are slowly coming around to that. Mm. Well, we can stay on that topic, so um, which is basically financing space startups and space activities. And you know, mm. like said, we have venture capital coming in. We had all the whole spec craze for a few months. So, do, do you okay. think space activities are financed in the "quote unquote" right way, or is there something we could further optimize there? Well, there's probably no right way to finance anything, right? It's a question of how do you get money. Uh, it is an art still to raise money, and there are only a few of us that kind of get the art and that's the bad side of it. Uh, but it's, it's a growing, uh, it's a growing capability. And I think, you know, ultimately the, the, the LPs are the people who write the checks that go into these funds recognize that, that space is, is the future. So, you know, I would think Hollywood really for painting a great uh, notion of our future in space is humanity for really, developing the underpinning for the space finance. Ultimately, that's where the money comes from. And, uh, you know, I think the market will work out whether or not it's VCs or PEs or, you know, we're finding a lot of family offices investing mm -hmm. directly with us. For example, the, the, the center of gravity has moved away from the, the VCs. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Also, of course, I have to talk my book and say that family offices should um, remember it's a deep tech sector. and Maybe they should align right. themselves with these special SBCs like, like in terms of each. No, that's <laughs> right. That, that's absolutely correct. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And then another question about a specific space activity. So you've been involved, as we mentioned, in, in, in Moon Express, and we're just a few days away, if all goes well, from the Artemis 1 launch. Yeah. Where do you see the lunar market going? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I think the lunar thing was a bit of a flash in the pan. Uh, there's there's sort of a resource argument for working the moon. There's maybe a practice to go to Mars argument, but ultimately it still takes a lot of energy to go there. And so I see the moon not dying, but I, I don't see it being the main thrust of energy. You know, once, uh, once Elon makes his first trip to Mars, everybody will start thinking about that. And uh, you'd be surprised when he plops boring machines down and starts putting holes in the ground and people can live underground and mm. things like that. You know, I think, I think the imaginational and any human energy will go to that. Gotcha. We'll, we'll come back to, to that part in a minute. All of these things together, like the last few minutes, uh, plus some more, I asked you um, towards the beginning of the podcast um, to sort of reflect back on the last 20 years and how it was different from what you imagine, what people imagine. I'm going to ask you the very unfair open-ended question, sort of what do you think, how, how may the space sector evolve the next 10, 20 years? What are some of the things that may happen? And and also what are some of the things that people maybe under-focused on and over-focused on? So whatever I tell you is going to be wrong. I can tell you that. Sure. <laughs> But you know, what I think will probably happen in the next 20 years is we'll see the uh, business of financing new space, uh, supplying new space ventures, and, and that whole business sort of mature pretty dramatically. We're seeing the government falling behind it. We're seeing finance falling behind it. We're seeing, you know, the, the LPs falling in behind this. I think that only continue to mature. And, uh, you know, assuming that that uh, there's no, you know, major catastrophe in the world, I don't see anything standing in the way of that happening because there's so much uh, application in space that's going to drive value that, that, you know, people are going to continue to put money into it. I think the other thing you'll see is eventually SpaceX will go to Mars. I think Elon... That's what he intended from the very beginning. He's made it clear later on in the company. That's what it was all about. That's what Starship's all about. It's too big to launch satellites. If you look at, you know, 100 metric tons per launch, only seven of those would launch the entire world supply of satellites every year. So it's obviously, you know, aimed at other things like launching water and heavy stuff. So you'll see that happen. And that will be maybe it may be in the 20 years, maybe it's a little bit longer lead to what I think will be the most famous human being ever. And I don't know what their name is, whether it's male, female, or otherwise, uh, but it'll be the first human not born on the earth. And mm -hmm. that'll be on Mars. And uh, that'll be, you know, we, we think of uh, Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon as a great, you know, uh, advancement of mankind. That'll be the next one. And uh, arguably more famous than Neil Armstrong was. And then uh, finally, I think you'll you'll see space become such a regular part of our lives. It already is, and we don't realize. But but in such a way that 
um, you know, it, it becomes fundamental to our economy. Right now, if we lost GPS and all these mm-hmm. other you know, space, we still go on. But I think it'll be so fundamental that the economy wouldn't work without it, much like we couldn't work without an electrical grid. So uh, that integration will continue and uh, become become a big part of what we're doing. So, so another way of asking this forward-looking question, of course, um, I'm inclined to ask if I'm an investor, is, is there something that should receive more investment in the space domain than, than it is right now? Well, I, I'm going to defend launch because I think nobody's solved the problem. I think there's a lot of very unserious companies out there that treat the, as, as, a, as a hobby rather than as a business, right? So People have to think of launch as a business. So I think there's still a lot of room for advancements in launch. And maybe, you know, maybe a one or two players will emerge as the leaders. I'm hoping we do. Um, you know, time may be right. Um, because we all know first to market is almost never the ones that dominate it. So, so there, that one's always there. I see communications as being probably the largest, uh, the largest sector that will continue to consume large amounts of dollars because it produces large amounts of value, you know, moving bits from point to point. I don't, I don't care how you look at it. It's, it's far more cost effective to move a bit from point to point on earth through space now than it is to dig cables and, you know, put, put stuff terrestrially. Uh, there, there's a lot more that destroys those networks and so on. And then uh, I think you'll start to see uh, uh, a lot more applications of imagery. There's a, there's a notion out there, that imagery is saturated, the market saturated mm. with imagery. I no. think that I think the yeah, the, the demand for imagery is infinite, just like bandwidth, right? Every time <laughs> my neighborhood they put in, you know, fiber into the neighborhood and I get the biggest, baddest fiber I can into my house. And everybody else is, I don't know what they're doing with the fiber, but I can't, you know, they consume all the bandwidth that's there. Same is true with imagery because you know, for some people. Like if you're a roofer and you want to just look at homes that have roofer problem, roofing problems to go solicit them, maybe an image every month is good enough. But if you're, you know, if you're a warfighter, an image every minute's what you need. So, so the dynamic side of of the Earth imagery is is really where the infinite demand comes from. And if the price point can get down and the convenience of utilization goes up, then you're going to see an explosion there. Uh, in, in, in much the same way you've seen an explosion of telecommunication. And then, of course, you know, supply chain has to support all of this because, you know, Ford doesn't build everything themselves. General Motors yep. doesn't build everything themselves. We know that this is the way things are done. Yeah. Companies yeah. This exists for a reason. To- totally agree with you on, on all of these points, especially, I mean, the, the imaging point. I think b- before we started recording, I mentioned to you, I'm at the International Space University summer course right now, and we literally spent the last few weeks talking about using space data, imagery data for non-space sector use cases. And I think we are really just scratching the surface because the, the, the space people don't understand the non-space industries by and large, right? And, and the non-space people don't understand what space data is available, but it's a very long topic by itself. And you come back to some of the pink points where we talked about, we need to take the friction out of this process. And yeah, we could talk a long time about that. And it'd be great. And I'm sure companies like Phantom can help us a lot. A lot in taking the friction out there. If the market takes us there, that's where we go, right? We're we're market agnostic. We 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 think we know what the, the market's gonna want, but maybe it'll be all imagery. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> we'll just to see. Let's um let's wrap up on a on a couple of fun questions. Um uh, one which I always ask and one which I, I think I've never asked before, but you've mentioned um race cars a few times now, and it's clearly a passion of yours. What's favorite favorite race car? Do you have one? Porsche, of course. The Porsche Cup cars. They 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 kill everybody. The Germans have taken what is what is really a, a poor design and optimized it to the point it beats the hell out of everybody. Yeah. So I I, I own one, two, three of them. So Okay, nice. I can endorse that being a German, clearly. <laughs> and then yeah, of course. the question I always ask is about science fiction, whether you enjoy science fiction, and if so, if you have any favorite works, and it could be movies, TV, books. You know, I don't, uh, because it irritates me. It, 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 and somebody gets one little point of it wrong, I lose all interest in it, and I, I stop watching the movie or reading the book. So I It has to be really, to... really hard science fiction, which is... It has to be accurate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it has to be accurate. Yeah, so Andy Andy Weir's uh, The Martian was the only one I liked, by the way. You know, I, I watched that and I said, everything about this is accurate. And, and I loved it. I loved the story. 
the, the um, you're talking about the movie as well, right? The Martian, yeah, the movie. In, yeah, in the, the movie. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, um, so so Jim Green, the former chief scientist of NASA, who was previously a guest on this podcast, I think he was the advisor to the movie, which right. explain explain that they got the things right. And Andy, the guy, the author, he's one of us, right? He just yep. wrote this, and it was like a self published thing on Amazon, and somebody picked up on it. Yeah, so that's no, that one. one. That's the only one I really like. I, of course, I love the old Star Trek, but not for it being science fiction. That you know, James Kirk was always my idea of the great leader. Right. And I still I still sort of swoon when I see old, you know, James Kirk from from uh, from from the 60s, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, terrific. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for coming on today. Best of luck with uh, Phantom Space. You are working on yeah. a lot of things which are very important for the space sector. So, yeah, I hope it's going to play out as you imagine for the next few years. So, too. Thanks, guys. And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. Lastly, if you have any feedback, including ideas for guests, and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell, or are interested in being a sponsor, drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com. See you for the next episode.